Welcome back. It's season 13, episode 10, double digits already, of the Ubuntu podcast. Today we're going to discuss where in the world people talk about Ubuntu. We've also got some command line love and all your lovely feedback. And joining me to go over all of that are Mark. Hello, hello. Hello, and Alan. Watcha. My amigos, how are you both? Tickety boo. I'm all right. Good. Alan, what have you been up to recently? Uh, against my better judgment, I helped my son build a computer. Uh, I haven't built a computer since his computer was built. <laughs> 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 and the CPU in that thing is a Sandy Bridge i7, which gives you some measure of how old this thing is. Probably about 2011, 2012, something like that. Does making Frankenstein think pads not count as building a computer? I don't make Frankenstein think pads. I make beautiful think pads. <laughs> um, it's not, I didn't really build a computer. He wanted a new case because the one he had is uh, a case made by a company called Zoo Storm. I bought it on Dabs, which shows how old. <laughs> or it might be an e-buyer or some, uh, one of those websites like nearly 10 years ago. And it's had like, it's like Trigger's Broom. It's had all the ship of, was it Theseus or some, whatever? Um, that's had all the internals replaced mostly, except the motherboard and the CPU. Mm -hmm. Everything else has been replaced. Uh, and he wanted to replace the case with something swishy and bigger fans that are quieter and LEDs. And he wanted to have it on the desk rather than under the desk, which is where it was because it was an eyesore. So he bought himself a case uh, off of Amazon. And when it arrived uh, that evening, we took his PC downstairs, stripped it down, took it outside, got rid of all the dust, and then basically transplanted everything into the new case. Managed to crowbar it all in, and uh, he sat with me, and we talked through what all the components were, because he's never built a PC before. So, you know, had to explain what all the bits were and how it all fitted together. And, uh, yeah, it was really, really good fun, real good learning exercise for him as to what actually goes on inside a PC. It was really, really good. Now it's on his desk, and uh, he has now it set the LEDs to red, and the LEDs behind his monitor are red, and he swapped his keyboard for a red keyboard, and he's downloaded the software for his mouse, and it's now a red LED on his mouse, and he's got a red mouse mat, and he's looking to get rid of his blue headphones and replace them with red headphones. Uh, it it does look like a special kind of bedroom with all these red, <laughs> red lights everywhere. It's really good news that these LEDs are capable of 16 million colours then. Yes, yes. 25500 <laughs> is all he needs. None of the others at all. I approve of Sam's choices because uh, that's exactly how I have this computer set up. <laughs> I have uh, red on the keyboard, red on the keypad, red on the mouse... All of the other things are accented red, except on the desk behind me, and everything over there is blue. It's very nice. It's very pretty. It's it's really nice for him to have. He he keeps his desk really clean and tidy as well. He loves his gaming workstation with his two displays and his LEDs and everything. But I just I I was really keen for him to understand what goes on inside the PC, mm. so he could understand. And he's now talking about. CPU upgrades, RAM upgrades, motherboard upgrades and stuff. So he's on the he's on the PC Master Race gravy train. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Right, shall we get into it then? So this week we're going to discuss where in the world people talk about Ubuntu. So there are some official places we talk about Ubuntu. Um, there's the Ubuntu blog, for example, where people uh, associated with the project or who work at Canonical post stuff to announce new things. That's not really a conversation, though, is it? That's not that. That's people saying things about Ubuntu, not necessarily talking about Ubuntu. Yeah, that's and, fair. And it used to the old version of the blog used to have a comment system uh, under it. I think that was switched off a couple of years ago in a site redesign, but it certainly used to be the case that uh, I remember Jane Silber posting about Ubuntu One shutting down. And golly gosh, wow, the uh, comments that appeared under that were <laughs> an interesting uh, <laughs> exercise. <laughs> so I can kind of see why they were turned off because there's plenty of other places for people to discuss, which we'll get onto in a bit. But yeah, I, 
that Ubuntu blog is is interesting. I mean, I've written articles for it, and our colleagues have written articles for it, and it's kind of the voice of Ubuntu, the voice of Canonical. But you know, there's a lot of other places that people talk about this stuff as well. But that's, I guess, that's like the in inverted commas official blog, right? Well, there's an unofficial blog. Wait, what? For Ubuntu. Is there? <laughs> well, I think a lot of people would regard uh, like OMG Ubuntu as like the the unofficial, official place where, you know, Ubuntu is talked about. I'm not sure Joey would like that because <laughs> if, I mean, I, I, I accept that probably some people think that, that, that OMG is a, is a canonical mouthpiece, but... Uh, you know, Joey is his own man. Joey, for those who don't know, Joey Snedden is the owner of OMG Ubuntu and he chooses what to write about. And very often he won't write about stuff that we, you know, we could throw him tidbits and say, Hey, there's this thing coming up. Would you like to write about it? And sometimes he just chooses not to because it's either not interesting or, you know, not, not something he feels passionate about. Right. So I wasn't suggesting that you know, OMG Ubuntu is a canonical property or an Ubuntu property, but that, that it has gravitas in the community as um, mm. sort of an authoritative place where Ubuntu is discussed. Yeah, I guess. It's it's an interesting one because there's lots of blogs like that. There's, and, you know, that's, that's a very popular one. You know, if you were going to go for where can I get news about Ubuntu that do, isn't the canonical mouthpiece, you know, isn't the party line then, yeah, I guess OMG is probably the first place I would go. But there's tons of others. It used to be that Web Update was one, and there were, and there's a few mm. others that talk about other stuff. And there's there's ones that are more focused on tutorials and guides, like Ubuntu Handbook and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, I guess, I guess I'd agree that OMG is probably the unofficial official. <laughs> it's like unofficial Nintendo Power Magazine or whatever it is. <laughs> well, and what else? Is there any other... Well, there's Planet Ubuntu as well, but it's it's strange that people blog less now. Um, yeah, I think yeah. Google Plus killed blogs; it really did. Everyone, um, everyone was blogging for a few years, and then when Google Plus came along, people wrote long form posts on Google Plus. You think of like Linus Torvalds, Mark Shuttleworth did, loads of other people. Alan Cox, the, yeah, Alan Cox was very active on Google Plus, and I think Google Plus was instrumental in killing off blogs because people would just post on Google Plus and then link to it from some other social media. And a lot of the mm. free software community would discuss there. And that's obviously, thanks, Google, that's now gone away. <laughs> but the effect is the same, is people don't blog as much now. Yeah. I mean, I, I stopped blogging and started using Google Plus, and I was an avid user of Google Plus, not mm. just for posting, but for Consumption. finding out what was going on, uh, you know, in the broader community. Yeah. And in fact, when I started Ubuntu Mate, the Google Plus, that's where the community initially coalesced, you know, around the Google Plus group. Yeah, and and the the communities in in Google Plus were huge. The I think the Ubuntu one at some point had two hundred and eighty thousand people in the in the Ubuntu community. So if you posted a blog post in there or an article in there, you would reach quite a lot of people. Now, obviously, Google Plus wasn't to everyone's taste, but I just wanted to mention it because it was a very popular place, mm. and I think that's a, a factor. I don't know, maybe some other people disagree about blogging, and maybe just maybe blogging just isn't interesting anymore, and everyone switched to. <laughs> But um, mm. that's that's what I found. But Planet Ubuntu is there, and it syndicates blogs if people write them. Yeah, when I when I first started using Ubuntu, so this was one of the alphas or betas of Warty Warthog. The first place that I uh, talked about Ubuntu was the Ubuntu forums. Oh, are they still going? Yes. So the Ubuntu forums has had a an interesting history. It it was. In inverted commas, unofficial. It was a community maintained thing. And that's, that's the thing about Ubuntu is there's the trademark policy is quite liberal. And so people mm. can create their own little community, their own little area of the internet, call it Ubuntu. And that's fine, you know, because the trademark policy allows that. Um, it's not like, you know, Nintendo who would come and, you know, stomp all over you for creating something with their brand name in it. Um, and the forum became very popular. It was one of the more popular of all the Linux forums. And after some time, I think it the hosting was migrated in-house because I think at, at some point it got hacked. 
some years ago uh, and some data leaked out of it. And uh, I think there were conversations to bring it in-house. So it's, ho- it's now hosted by Canonical, but it's still mostly used by non-Canonical people. The vast majority of Canonical employees don't actually visit Ubuntu forums at all. It's very much a grassroots community thing. Mm. And there's some people who, who don't like the fact that Canonical people don't sit on the forums. Um, I think it's because it's more of a user-centric place. Um, a bit like the uh, mailing lists that used to exist. There was one called Sounder and one called Ubuntu mm. Users. Ubuntu Users still exists. Um, and and they were very user-centric and not a lot of canonical people hung out there. So are mailing lists still a, a big part of the Ubuntu community these days? Not so much. Uh, they are still there and they are still active, like Ubuntu Devel and Ubuntu Devel Discuss. But like most free software communities, they've kind of, they've been on the wane. And what seem, most free software projects seem to be coalescing around is discourse. And that's what we've done as well. And we've had, this is the second discourse we've had, uh, <laughs> Ubuntu discourse. We had one that was set up a while back, but the time wasn't right. And, it wasn't particularly well organized and well managed. And so the software fell behind and there was no real orchestrated push to get people onto it. But with the reboot that happened a few years ago, we, um, we created this course and we actually shut down a couple of, uh, Ubuntu mailing lists and just forcibly told everyone, look, just use discourse, stop using the mailing list. And it's really helped the desktop team. Uh, before mm-hmm. Martin took over, under Will, we shut down the Ubuntu desktop mailing list and created a, a section, a category on discourse. And I think that has really helped people engage with the desktop team because you see like the weekly updates yep. that are in there. People pick that up and, and that becomes blog articles or news articles because people can see you know, and engage with the desktop team. It's a, it's a lot more interactive on discourse than it ever was on, on, well, than it has been in the last five years on mailing lists because you could just jump into a conversation. Whereas yeah. on a mailing list, you had to, you know, first of all, discover that this post, this plain text post was there on a mailing list, then figure out how to join it and then somehow reply to a mail that you didn't actually have because the mail, the mail was never sent to you because you joined after the mail was sent. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was a horrible interface and discourse kind of fixed that. And it's not just the desktop team, right? Because we see, you know, uh, articles in Pharonix, you know, Michael picks up these uh, bits of information from various teams at Canonical. He knows what's been going on. There's usually links to the upstream projects where the work has happened. And it's been written by the person who's done the work. So he's able to not just explain what's been going on, but who's been doing it as well. So it's put some identity behind some of the work that goes on within Canonical and Ubuntu. And there's a bit of friction between discourse and Ubuntu forums. There are people who are super <laughs> loyal to the Ubuntu forums. And how dare you create this other forum, this other thing that isn't Ubuntu forums. And frankly, a lot of us that are fans of discourse just don't like the software that Ubuntu forums uses. It's V bulletin. It's awful. And personally, I'm very much not a, not a forum person. And I, I was for years, anyone who knows me knows that I was anti forum and pro mailing lists because I just found mailing lists easier to use for my email client because for me it worked. And I hated forums and the way that you had to page down, page down, page down through all these pages and pages of stuff to find the actual answer is on page 13, like message number eight or something. Whereas discourse makes it a lot easier to link directly to stuff and, and you can operate it like a mailing list if you want to. So mm-hmm. I think there's, there's still that separation of you're either a forums person or you're a discourse person. Um, but I think that's one of the good things is in Ubuntu, there are loads of these little pockets of the internet. There's loads more we could uh, rattle off, but though, though, I think those are the main ones. Those are the main places where stuff gets discussed, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, the Ubuntu forums are more user focused, you know, mm. um, assistance and advice and all of that. And then the other place that where that goes on is Ask Ubuntu, where people post their questions and, you know, then a community of people then provide, you know, answers. And that's invaluable. Now that's something I use almost on a daily basis, Ask Ubuntu. Mm. Mm. And that's a really hard thing to curate as well because all of these other places where people discuss ubuntu people ask support questions 
oh people people if they discover there's there's somewhere to ask a technical question they'll ask it doesn't matter yeah. doesn't matter where it is i mean it's, the amount the amount of support questions we get in our podcast telegram channel which is completely unofficial mostly talking about how to make good roast potatoes mm-hmm. nothing to do with ubuntu <laughs> support the amount of support questions we get just in there yeah i think i think it's it's interesting how when ask ubuntu was first set up a few years ago um the the motivation was this is a better way we can we can have someone ask a question it can be edited afterwards so that it's it's not you know preserved in aspic looking like garbage <laughs> with a question where the questioner has walked away and no longer cares what it says which is what happens on forums right someone will ask a question hmm. they get their answer and then they walk away and never come back whereas with ask ubuntu because it's editable by the uh, by the community you can tweak it and modify it slightly and later on when that question is you know worded slightly wrong or or isn't appropriate or it's very busy because that topic is suddenly popular it can be reworded slightly by the community and the the original poster may have no maybe completely oblivious and so mm. ask ubuntu is is great for that and the whole voting system and the gamification mm. and all of that made it a super popular support site but again there was some friction because it came along late and the people who were on Ubuntu forums were like, why are you creating this other forum? And it's like, it's not a forum. It's a Q&A system. And so there's there's still these pockets of places. Like, so we've got discourse yeah. where development discussion happens. Right. Ubuntu forums where user-focused discussion and support happens and then ask Ubuntu for Q&A and support. It's like... We've still got these. Th- I don't think you could possibly merge those three together, and I don't think there's any intention to, and there's no attempt to. But some people think it should happen, if, or some people think one of the three should die, or two of the three should die, and one should live on and survive. But that's not going to happen, I don't think. I think they all serve their audiences very well, mm. and there's there's space for all of them. So you mentioned earlier about how Google Plus had uh, been instrumental in sort of um drying up blog posting but uh you know these days there's people posting videos on youtube and library about ubuntu and i've even heard there are podcasts about ubuntu no way hold on a second what's library (laughs) is this the new hotness in video streaming uh kind of it's like a decentralized video platform built on blockchain technology <laughs> sorry. Oh, oh, that really hurt for me to say that. I'm sorry. Uh is this like peer tube then? Kind of. It's you Except you are, it works. Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's actually really good. Okay. It, it works pretty well. I've uploaded some videos there. Uh you get a little bit of engagement. It's a bit embryonic. It's like 0.42 or something. But the goal is to supplant I think supplant YouTube as like the go-to video delivery platform because you're in control of it. You don't have these, you know, mega corporations who decide, you know, what you see and what you don't see, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just a place. And a lot of free software people who, the kind of people who would go to Google Plus to discuss stuff or would go to certain alternative places, shall we say, are on library. It, I call it right. library, but it's spelled L-B-R-Y. Um and yeah, there's there's a lot of free software tutorials and stuff. Some people mirror from YouTube to library or vice versa. Um, but yeah, I, there are there are there is quite a lot of Ubuntu related content on these video platforms. Some good, some bad. You know, everyone's got mm-hmm. an opinion. There's about a bazillion videos about how to install Ubuntu in all of the different hypervisors. Install Ubuntu in VMware. Install Ubuntu in Virtual. Install Ubuntu in... Well, you know what? It turns out that people search for these terms. And Mm. it makes sense for you to make a video that fulfills the need of people searching for, how do I install Ubuntu in thing, whatever that thing is. So, yeah, it's... and. And the key thing about these these video platforms is they have discussion areas and community. Like YouTube has a community tab <laughs> for each uh, content creator. And then there's the comments section underneath the videos, which obviously nobody looks at, but lots of people do. And lengthy discussions happen in these these comment sections. People ask technical support questions in the comments under a YouTube video. <laughs> and... Yep like point out flaws in in your platform or your your system or discuss the relative merits of one distro versus another happens 
And, and these are the same people. It's not like this is a clique of people on YouTube who are entirely separate from the people who are on Ask Ubuntu, who are entirely separate from the people who are somewhere else. It's the same faces you see pop up in all these places, plus a bunch of other randoms on the internet. Yeah, this guy called Alan Pope seems to post on a lot of them. I, t I do sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I sometimes reply to people on uh, on YouTube. And actually, that gets you a bit of kudos, actually, mm. because there's not a lot of operating system vendors <laughs> whose employees <laughs> will reply to you on a YouTube comment right. if, if you point mm. something out. And, and you know, we get, I don't do it for the kudos. I don't do it for the credit. I do it because someone asks a question and I want to answer it. Like, so I'll do that. And I've seen other people like Martin does it as well. And we, we get mentioned in people's videos because, oh, Alan dropped my, my video and answered my question. It's like, yeah, cause we're just human beings like, you know, doing our stuff. It's, if you, if you avoid the horrible parts, some bits of YouTube are quite nice. <laughs> yeah, they are. So that's a, that's a lot of places where Ubuntu is being discussed. So my question to our listeners would be, what have we missed? Where is Ubuntu being discussed that we didn't get to? But more importantly, where should people be talking about Ubuntu where they are not? And what could we do to address that? And with that, let's, let's move on. So, as is a time-honoured tradition, it is time for some command line love. And I believe Mark has some command line love for us today. Yes. So, uh, this week's command line love was um, discussed, I think, in our Telegram channel. Uh, and it's called COD. Call of Duty? No. Completion Demon, obviously. Oh. So, uh, I spoke a few episodes ago about adding autocomplete to commands in bash. Um, and it turns out that there's a very handy tool called completion demon, which you can add to your bash RC file. And what this will do is it'll run in the background. And whenever you run a command with dash dash help as an argument, which then shows you all of the other arguments that it takes, it'll then pass that screen and it will create auto completions. So next time what? you run that command, you can hit tab and it'll find things that it knows about from the help screen and auto complete for you. That's magic. I know. I love that. And it also up so if you run if you update the program and you run help again and it's got new things, it'll then notice and update itself. So what you're saying is it's a keylogger and spyware looking at the output <laughs> of commands that you type. <laughs> Is the glass half empty, you know, perspective on this application? Possibly, yes. Well, it's only looking at what applications can do. You, Yeah, you might want to read the source code and make sure you're happy with it. <laughs> this, is, this is quaint and lovely, and I just wish everyone would start using Fish Shell, which has this stuff built in and, and does command line completion forever. It's worth pointing out that this, yeah, completion demon works on Bash and uh, ZSH, but it doesn't work on fish because fish kind of does this anyway. So fish will do the parsing of dash dash help kind of stuff. And it just knows what to do for all commands in the universe. You start typing a command, you put tack and then start typing and tab and it will tab complete. You give you, give you the options that you can use. If you've typed in VE, it will show verify or version. verification or version. Yeah. But how does it know? Like, if I write my own application and I create the da the help for it, do, do I have to submit the output to Fish, or does do I have to have run dash dash help once for it to get it or something? You know, there's like um, Bash command line completion templates that get installed when you install right. packages. There's a similar thing for Fish that it knows the capabilities of the utilities. Hmm. Very neat. Two for one. You get a double bubble command line <laughs> this week. <laughs> Right. Thank you for that, Mark. Let's move on. There's always room for more feedback. On our website, each episode has its own comments. So post yours on ubuntupodcast.org. And now it's time for all your wonderful feedback. 
Um, we do read it all. Yes, even your essay, Frank. Thank you for that. But we can't read it all out. And boy, do we have a bucket load today. So Joe, not that one, emailed us at <laughs> <laughs> show at Ubuntu podcast.org. In season 13, episode six, there was a mention of passing along events and training. And while I haven't done that, I did spend some time recently creating several introductory videos using Linux. I'm not an expert on any one topic, but I do try and link to demonstrate these contexts, concepts to the best of my ability. All content is absolutely free. I hope that it can be passed on as helpful to others looking to get their feet wet. And we will add a link to Joe's videos. And Paul also emailed us i have been playing with hugo on and off <laughs> lucky hugo for a while <laughs> using the hugo snap package i had a small issue with hugo versions breaking my site i've solved the issue but this made me want to understand the snap package process i guess you can install stroke run any previous application snap version example hugo version whatever on my research, I think this is controlled by the developer, which is good, using channels like stable, edge, etc. So if the version you require is no longer in a channel, you cannot install it anymore. If I am understanding it correctly, then I think this would be a handy for another command process to install older snap versions. Just would like to hear your thoughts on the topic and send me the right direction to find out more. So yes, you are right that if a developer publishes version one and then later they replace that with version two in the store you as a user can revert from two to one and then as time passes on and eventually you're on version 12 or version 13 or whatever you can't revert all the way back to version one you can't manually forcibly install a really old version of the snap because the whole goal of snaps is to keep people moving forward to update to the newer releases and not have loads of old versions of software hanging around uh, on people's machines because potentially they have security holes in them etc so yes that's that's the answer to the question if you wanted to have an old version of the software if it's open source you can go and get the source and build it yourself Although you do say that the versions that is published are controlled by the developers, which is true. And there is a facility in the Snap Store called Tracks. So if they have versions that they have long term support for, like Firefox, they could have tracks for older versions that they're maintaining, just point releases for security fixes and stuff like that. But that's at the discretion of the developers, and that's largely governed by how big their teams are and how how much manpower they have to maintain older versions of the software. But tracks do exist for publishers who want to provide, you, you know, long-term stable versions of things. I mean, you could, if you if you went and got the YAML for Hugo, you could uh, go and cherry pick the release that you want, like this whatever version 40.1, clone the repository, wind the clock back to that point in time, and then run Snapcraft and build the Snap and install it locally yourself. You could do that. And all you're doing is effectively reproducing the build that went into the store you know, a year ago or whatever, the one you want, and you could manually install that. I mean, that's, that's useful because the build is, is easily redoable on your system because the tool that the developer used to build the snap, Snapcraft, probably you could install and run the same thing. George also emailed us. I enjoyed learning more about the added features in 2004. Seemed like much of what was mentioned is enhancements for further gaming. I'm not a gamer, but anything that increases the appeal of Linux and possibly leads to better and more software is great. ZFS has a lot of potential, but at this point, I'm happy with EXT4, full disk encryption, and backup tools with which I'm familiar. I installed Mainline 2004 on a basic NUC I use for testing, straight from the ISO. It's beautiful. I was excited about high DPI scaling, as I've been very happily using 4K TVs to replace my tiny HD monitors. I've been running either scaled two times or at full HD. I'd hope the new scaling options would provide crisper details, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Am I missing something? Why isn't GNOME tweaks included in the basic install? Why can't GNOME extensions be installed more easily? And dark mode is lovely, but needed GNOME tweaks, and I'm not sure why that's a hoop which users must jump through. Okay, where do we Let's start? Start with high DPI. So if you've got a 4K monitor and you are using scaling, 
then uh, it won't be crisper because it's not the native, you're displaying an image that's not the native resolution mm. of your panel. So um, if you're using scaling, because uh, you have different sized monitors, it, it suggests here a 43 and a 49 inch, then you're going to get some uh, potential blurring uh, as you down sample the resolution of the display. Have I missed anything on, on the high DPI thing? No. I don't, I know nothing about high DPI because everything I've got is 1080p. Right. Okay. Now, as for GNOME tweaks not being installed in the basic install and why extensions can't be installed more easily, this is a bit like when people used to say, why isn't Compiz settings manager installed by default in Ubuntu? And that's because GNOME tweaks and Compiz settings uh, manager are powerful tools that potentially give you the ability to break your system. <laughs> so we don't want to put that in the hands of people by default. An enthusiast such as yourself who knows what GNOME Tweaks is for and what you can do with it, you know how to install it and make use of it. But we don't want to put that in front of regular users. The final point that uh, he makes about uh the user themes thing, I think you can't... But so by default, the dark mode, if you turn on dark mode in Yaru, everything is dark except menus. So the notification area punches you in the face is bright, like light color, and everything else is dark. And I think that's because we don't enable the user theme setting. And so what he's saying is you have to install GNOME tweaks in order to change that uh, and to add the extension for user themes and then change the user theme to dark which yes it is quite a, a hoop to jump through and i think the yaru team have been discussing ways to make that easier i think i think i can say that we didn't add that because we thought it would be um upsetting to some people in the community um I don't really need to go into it more detail than that, but I, I think we were we were trying to be careful because every change that we introduce in Ubuntu is a change from upstream GNOME, right? And the more things we do that deviate from that, the more maintenance work it is for us mm -hmm. and can put pressure on upstream as well. And I think it was a bit of a balancing act. And I don't know, maybe we got it wrong and maybe we should look at re look at introducing that I, d I honestly don't know but it's a conversation we certainly need to have because i i mean i personally i agree it's it doesn't look visually consistent when you turn on dark mode and then you open the notification area and it's definitely not dark and you have to jump through a couple of hoops it should be i tick the box that says dark mode it should be dark that's but unfortunately, that means an extension needs adding and a button needs pressing. And, you know, we don't ship that extension by default. And that's more code for us to, well, you know, I say us, your team, Martin, to maintain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's all it's all about compromises. You know, how far mm. do you take these things? How far, uh, how far do you go with them? And there's also some upstream initiatives around making the theme changing styling integration more cohesive. So we didn't w want to going a direction uh, on our own when we know there's an upstream effort uh, happening as well. So Matthias has also emailed us. I upgraded from 1804 on my laptop to 2004. I had planned a full Saturday for this procedure, but it was done after a disappointing three hours and I didn't know what to do with the rest of my time. I must say 2004 is an awesome release. Like every LTS release, it makes me wonder how I survived on the old LTS because this is so much better. I want to thank the Ubuntu team, the GNOME team and the app developers who make it possible to run Linux as a daily driver. I just donated a couple of coffees to each group. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you, Matthias. Yeah, it's funny how... Um, you build up this, oh, I'm going to set aside a day to do an upgrade. Oh, I'm not looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. And I've started to become quite blasé. My my home servers here, I've got three of them in a row, and they were all running an old LTS release. And I thought, ah, I'll just upgrade them. They'll be fine. And they were. It was like no problem at all. Um, I've started to get really blasé with upgrades. But I know some people are really pensive and really worried that an upgrade is absolutely going to screw the pooch. And it can. Arch users. <laughs> well... <laughs> 
unfortunately sometimes upgrades break and if you're left with a black screen and a blinking cursor after you just upgraded your precious main computer i can imagine that's a frustrating experience mm. and people want mm. to avoid that nobody wants to do that twice <laughs> it did happen during the transition between the beta to the release we had um a couple of days where we may have had a package that uh, really broke your system to the point it wouldn't boot in spectacular ways. And in fact, uh, one of our listeners, um, Jeffrey, uh, uh, he actually offered assistance to Mark Shuttleworth, who encountered this bug at a weekend. <laughs> and in Launchpad, Jeffrey provides the steps that Mark needed to go through in order to recover his machine. <laughs> So well done, Jeffrey. <laughs> it's a great leveler when uh, the computer won't boot. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter right. what status you have. It yeah. doesn't matter whether you own the company. If your computer won't boot, <laughs> you're in just as much of a stuck situation as everyone else. I love it. Yeah. So Kubuntu also emailed us. That's C-U-R. No, it's not one of the distros. It's somebody <laughs> using a, an ubuntu -y name. Perhaps more people would join the Ubuntu podcast folding at home team number 243272 if they had mentioned on the podcast. There you go. I just assumed that you had a team and was rewarded with its discovery of equal importance for those running 1910 and 2020 versions of various Ubuntu related flavors. Please tell us how to overcome the inability to install a folding at home client because of the lack of Python 2 in these latest OS versions. Once I upgraded to 2004, it's impossible to install the folding at home client because of these missing dependencies. Not Ubuntu's fault, of course, but you're the chaps who make it work if you can. This sounds like a case for Snap, surely. Uh, well, interesting you should say that. So the first thing to address here is I'm seeing people say there is no Python 2 in 2004, which is not the case. Python 2 is there. It's in the universe archive. However, what isn't happening is uh, when you install Python 2, it doesn't create a uh, binary in user bin for the Python 2 interpreter by default. And that's because Python 2 is end of life this year. So we're deliberately making it hard for people to run Python 2 because that is going to be beyond its security maintenance very soon. So you can create, you know, a sim link to expose that interpreter should you need, but Python 2 is there. Now, the other interesting thing is the folding at home documentation has installation instructions in two places. One of them's really outdated. And if you try and install those packages, they don't work. You have to find the other place where the new versions of the packages are referenced, which were updated a couple of weeks ago and are kept up to date routinely. Those work just fine. And yes, folding at home should be a snap. Maybe somebody listening to this would want to take that one on. I did consider doing that, but uh, didn't get around to it. Carl Cunningham also emailed us. I'm using 1804. Some websites have annoying JavaScript, which blocks control V for pasting passwords and the like, which makes it very difficult to use a password manager with complex passwords. I wanted to create a new keyboard shortcut mapped to the paste function, but I couldn't work out how to do it. I can see how to create a new shortcut, which performs various desktop functions or runs a command, but I didn't see paste as one of the functions that could be mapped to a key combination. Any tips for this? I'm sorry, Carl, that Alan has edited uh, in his reading of your email and, oh, and did I? Uh, not mentioned the version of Ubuntu that you're running there. Um, I've got a tip. I, I, I'm not sure if this will work, but the, the only thing I could think of is maybe setting up some kind of macro with xdo tool using its type feature. Um, in order to inject key presses into a form. Mm, that's actually what, um, if you use uh, the pass password manager tool and install, well, it's, it comes with a tool called pass menu, and that uses xdo tool to type into password fields. Um, another thing you might try, actually, if it's specifically blocking uh, control V rather than blocking paste in general, uh, try doing shift insert. Ah. ah, yes, good idea. 
Uh, and the other thing I would say is for all of you people thinking X do tool that won't work on Wayland, uh, then go and find yourself a copy of Y do tool, <laughs> which does work on Wayland. Doesn't have any of the windowing uh, capabilities, but it does do um, key presses and typing and things of that nature. Uh, and Tumble emailed us. Wimpy, I've enjoyed learning about some of your impressive Bash scripts projects lately. Outside of basic backup scripts, I'm a bit lost. As a Bash scripting guru, are there any resources that you recommend to help noobs learn the tips and tricks for larger projects? Are you going to add that to your LinkedIn? As as a as a as a what? Sorry, what was that? As a as a what? Uh, I think I think he <laughs> erroneously claimed you're a Bash scripting guru. Mm, mm. He obviously hasn't seen um Zorpig. <laughs> <laughs> we should we should put links to that video in the in the show notes at some point. Um, so I. I thought I knew how to do bash scripting and then I read a book and the book is called pro bash programming. It's in its second edition and is available from a press. And that was the book that I read. I don't know, maybe 15 years ago that basically uh, spells out that bash is a proper programming language and there's a lot of sophisticated features and capabilities and really got me thinking about oh i can i can do string comparisons and i can use arrays and uh, this is how to do arithmetic the right way and all sorts of things so that's the book i would recommend it's the one i i used the first edition but it was a great great book i really enjoyed it mal gamble emailed us I would like to hear your opinions on whether it would ever be practical to package the various Ubuntu flavors as snaps over a suitable base system so that they'd be easy to switch desktop environments. This would avoid the need for dual or more booting using a VM to try out the alternatives. Oh gosh, we have this conversation every so often where it's like, hey, what if the entire desktop was a snap? And then we realize that's really hard. Um, and I think attempts have been made to try and package components of the desktop, but not the whole thing as a snap in the past, because it's just the, the thing that gets in the way most of the time is confinement. And with confinement, it breaks the rules of what applications and, and components that think they can write anywhere on the disk and try and talk to each other in particular ways that snaps kind of rein in. Um, which makes it difficult. But that said, I'm sure Martin uh, has uh, another perspective, maybe. It's definitely a lofty goal and something we should investigate. So um, let's let's watch this space and see what we can come up with. And uh, Jake the Peg left a comment on our Reddit. I have suggestions of small, simple programs for Alan to consider snapping. Why me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> And he, he's given a list of one, two, three, four things. Uh, Densify. This will take a 23 meg PDF and downscale it to two meg. That sounds handy. Um, PDF Ranger, PDF Arranger, PDF Arranger. This opens a multi-page PDF and permits rearranging pages within. I think Jake the Peg is a bit of a PDF fan here. Mm. Um, next one is Shutter a screenshot tool that requires fiddling with dependencies before it works properly. You are in luck, Jacob Egg. <laughs> I snapped Shutter last week. <laughs> it's an absolute monster, and it took far too long to do because it's a bazillion lines of Perl <laughs> and GTK2 and uh, GVFS and all kinds of other hairy stuff and deconf and uh, and... Um, I don't understand it all, but I managed to jam it all inside a snap. And so if you snap install shutter, you will have that. The reason I did it is because it is my favorite screenshot tool. The, what I actually snapped it for is because the, I wanted to take a screenshot of the distro watch page and draw a load of red arrows on it. And, uh, <laughs> I couldn't find an image editor that really easily let me draw red arrows on something to, point something at you know to something else and uh so i snapped shutter in order to fulfill that personal need to draw red arrows and boxes on top of screenshots so you'll find that one in the snap store uh, and the final one is pinter which is simple image manipulation that needs mono dependencies and is too unstable to use on recent versions of ubuntu yes i think um 
Igor, our colleague, wrote a blog post about preserving old programs in Snaps, and that's that's what some of these are. You know, the requirement that Jake has, like Shutter, it's old, unmaintained, relies on very old technologies. And Igor wrote a blog post about preserving old. I think he did Composer, the old mm-hmm. web editor tool. Um, but yeah, that's why I snap shutter is to preserve it and let it continue running beyond, you know, the system where all the dependencies are busted. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And finally, Graham emailed ThinkPad Corner. I bought a rather battered ThinkPad on Yahoo Auctions, an E440 like I used to have, and I know it'll have some issues, so I thought I'd search the podcast website for links to good ThinkPad sites. Can you recommend any sites? As I know there's a few about, I will be running Ubuntu on it. So, uh, thank you for emailing ThinkPad Corner. <laughs> um, and <laughs> the, the two places I tend to recommend, one is ThinkWiki. <laughs> uh think wiki is a it's basically a media wiki site that's got details about all the different um think pads basically every model is covered there uh, and the other place is a community on reddit there's a think pad subreddit and it's great uh people in there are uncharacteristically lovely and <laughs> like to talk about uh think pads and there, there's a lot of them that run arch on thinkpads and there's a bunch of screenshots and stuff and the thing that i find most fun is when people take photographs and post them a photograph of a thinkpad and post it in the r thinkpad subreddit it gets tagged as thinkstagram <laughs> which i think is really quite cute <laughs> it's a thinkstagram picture uh so yes uh, those are the two places i would go uh, also, people talk about ThinkPads in the Ubuntu Podcast Telegram group, which you'll find at ubuntupodcast.org slash telegram. Very good. And that is all of your feedback. Just a quick thank you to Christopher Patty for his command line love suggestion, which is now safely deposited in our vault of love. <laughs> If you love the command line as much as we do, send us a command that will blow our minds, and we might even mention it on the show. Send your command line love to show at ubuntupodcast.org. And that is all for episode 10. Boy, howdy, that was a lot of feedback. Thank you all for sending that in. Please do keep sending it, though. We love getting it. Uh, next week, we'll be discussing community news and goings on and no events because apparently uh, the world is on pause right now. But if you've got some feedback for us, you can get us on show at ubuntupodcast.org or in our Telegram channel, as Alan mentioned, ubuntupodcast.org forward slash Telegram. And curiously, after two years of promoting uh, YouTube, we stopped doing it this year, and our channel is trending up like never before. So go <laughs> go and join everyone else on uh, youtube.com Ubuntu Podcast. Uh, thank you all very much for listening, and we'll speak to you next time.